whatever. Okay, good. Uh, so the uh, exciting topic this uh, today. So today, what I'll talk about is uh, probably uh, the most beautiful algorithm of linear algebra. And I'll also talk to you about the, the, the most impactful algorithm of linear algebra. Okay, so if, when, if you want to, um, uh, to showcase to people how matrices can be used and how linear algebra is beautiful, um, then this is the way to showcase that. Um, and the method we'll talk about is uh, page rank, um, and this is named by a couple of uh, pri uh, previous Stanford students, um, and this was all developed here. Okay, so uh, we will start the following. We'll start looking at the web as a graph. Okay, so the idea will be is that we will take um, we'll take a real system, we'll take the web, and we will represent it as a directed graph. And then we will use the language of graph theory in terms of uh, strongly connected components. Um, and we will design a computational experiment to learn something about the structure of the web. OK, that's the, that's the idea of what we will do. And we will want to conceptu conceptualize how does the web look like. And it will have this bow tie structure, like the bow tie you put um, on your neck. So that's the, that's the high level overview of the lecture today. So the first thing is, we need, the question we want to ask high level is, how does the web look like at the global level? And when I say web, what do I mean? I mean the network connectivity representation of the web, which means we will have nodes as web pages, and we will have edges as hyperlinks. There is more and more this issue of what, what a node is. Like in the old days when uh, web was static, we had basically the HTML 1.0, it was very clear what the web is. If you go to my web page, it's a static HTML 1.0, very nice, right? If you go on uh, Google News, um, Facebooks, and other places, right, there is, it's not that every unique piece of content has a URL, but it's just one URL where every time different content is being shown. So we will kind of ignore this part a bit, and uh, we will um, focus on static web pages on the web. The other thing we will also kind of ignore is what people call that dark matter which would be inaccessible pages on the web that are behind firewalls, behind passwords, uh, logins, and so on. So these are kind of issues we will ignore. So for us, web will be this set of web pages. There will be links between those web pages. And all these um, web pages have unique URLs, right? So when I say a page, I mean a unique URL. So the way you could think of this is maybe there are some web pages here. Right, um, and the way we will connect them is that maybe you know I teach a class on networks that's on my website, and I link to this website that talk or this web page that talks about the class. And this uh, thing says, "Oh, the classes are in the Gates Building. Don't uh, they are here in Nvidia?" Okay, um, but you know there is a link here that points I know to the Stanford Computer Science Department, where the, the Computer Science Department says. We are the computer science department at Stanford University. And then if you click on Stanford, you end up on the Stanford University main web page. That's what we mean to create a graph, right? So all these links, in some sense, are navigable, navigational. So this is what we will think of the structure of the web. As I s kind of hinted before, today, many links on the web are transactional, which means after you click them, not necessarily, you, you don't necessarily navigate to a new URL, but you know, you post something, you execute something, you like something, you buy something. And this is a different type of links that we are not considering here. So we are really considering this kind of prehistoric view of what the web is. Okay? And then you can think of the web as this directed graph where there are web pages and web pages point to one another. And uh, essentially, the way you can think of this is these are all the web pages that Google indexes, right? Like, if you say today I'm using Google or web search, it's basically able to search over this type of static, unique web pages. And the other thing is, how are these web pages discovered? Is that you have these web crawlers or web spiders, where you start at a couple of websites on the web, and then you consume links and do kind of a breadth first search exploration of the web. And this is what Google does every night, basically. Right, so that essentially you go and discover what are web pages on the web. There is no central directory, so you have to do the breadth first search over this graph to identify the pages. And this is the structure of the graph we'll be looking at. Um, there are other examples of information networks that you can think uh, in a similar way. You can take citations between the papers, where every node is a paper, and how these papers link each other. 
for example, because this graph only uh, you can only link back in time, this graph should have no loops, right? Each I write a paper, I cite everyone uh, that was there before me. So when the next paper can comes again, they can cite me and everyone later. So loops shouldn't exist in this graph. This should be a directed acyclic graph. Um, you know, references in, in encyclopedia is another example of a information network of how concepts uh, relate to each other. Okay, so these are examples of things we will be looking at. Now, make go going back to our example of the web graph, the question is, how does the web look like? What would be a good map, kind of conceptual picture of the web? And this is research uh, that was done um, basically 20 years ago. Um, uh, and at that time, this was, I think, done at combination of IBM and Alta Vista. And Alta Vista was search engine we thought is the best thing in the universe and nothing can be better. And then Google came and we saw how much better search can be. But at some point in time, there was Alta Vista and it was absolutely killing it. But it, was, it wasn't so good. I don't know if you guys remember. But either way, right? So this is now 20 years old. Um, and uh, the the question they were asking is this, you know, how is the web organized? And they said, given a node V, what other nodes can we reach from that node V? That was what they were asking um, uh, themselves. And the question is both, what can we reach going out from V, but also what can, who else can reach this node, uh, this arbitrary node V? So this means we will define two notions, two, se two sets. We will define an in component and an out component. An in component of V are all the nodes W where W can reach node V. And the out component is all the nodes W where V can reach uh, W. OK? Um, so in our case, if V is this node A, then for example, the in component is, uh, um, of node A is A itself. It's uh, node B. Um, it's node uh, C. It's node um, uh, E and it's node G, right? These are all the nodes where I can get, where, where I can go from, and I can get back to the node. So that's the in component, because I'm kind of going towards the node. And then what is the out component? If I start here, who do I reach? I can reach D, I can reach B, I can reach F, I can reach C. So that's the out component here, right? These are the two um, examples. And then uh, that's the first thing, this in and out component. The second thing is that there are two types of directed graphs. Um, and there are directed graphs that are strongly connected. And we already talked about that, which means that any node can reach any other node. So this means that the in component of a given node is the same as the out component of a given node is all the nodes of the network. right? If I can reach everyone and everyone can reach me, then in and out will be the same. And because I can reach everyone, this should be everyone, OK? So that's the strongly connected directed graph. And then there is another type of a directed graph that's called directed acyclic graph. Basically, this is a directed graph that has no cycles. So the, what, is, what does it mean, no cycles? You can reach V, then V cannot reach you, right? So there's always a path, but only path in one way, right? So um, this is an example of directed acyclic graph. You can think of it essentially as a, as a graph, almost like, yeah, you can think of it as some kind of generalization of the tree, right? Where any node can go to its parents, but you can never navigate to a child, right? So you can go from E to then B and A, and then to uh, C and D, right? But you see there is no cycles here. I can go one way, I cannot go the other way. Right? But if it would be a cycle, I could get kind of, I could just cycle on the cycles. And what is interesting is that any directed graph can be expressed in terms of these two types. Um, what do I, what do I uh, mean? What, what do I mean by that? I mean that any in any directed graph, I can take strongly connected components, merge them into super nodes, and then whatever are the connections between the super nodes, that's a DAG. And you can nicely prove this by contradiction, by basically saying, if, too strongly co if I would merge two strongly connected components, and now they, it would, there would be paths both ways, then these strongly connected components are not the largest ones, so the entire thing is a strongly connected component. And that's the contradiction. Um, and I have the hidden slide, I think, after this one that, um, that, that gives the proof. 
OK? So now the question is, how is the web organized around in terms of these uh, strongly connected components and this directed as acyclic graph? So just to give, you, to give you an example, right? A strongly connected component is a set of nodes such that every pair of nodes in S can be reached can reach each other, and there is no larger set containing S. So it means strongly connected component is the biggest, is as big as it can be, right? Why do I say this? For example, this is the graph I had before, and this is the, the, the decomposition of the graph on the strongly connected components, right? And notice that this thing here contains four nodes, even though this by itself is already strongly connected, right? Anyone on this cycle can reach each other. But there exists a bigger, a superset that is still strongly connected, and that's this entire thing, right? So the point is, there is S is as big as it can be. So these are now strongly connected components. And then the, the, the claim is, right, that any directed graph um, um, uh, is a directed acyclic graph on its strongly connected components, right? So basically, the idea is that strongly connected components partition the nodes of G. Uh, that, that is that one node, each node belongs to exactly one strongly connected component. So this is uh, my graph. Um, and I showed you before what the strongly connected components are. And now the second claim is that if I build a different graph, let's, let's call it G prime, whose nodes are strongly connected components, and there is an edge between the nodes of G prime, if there exists an edge between the corresponding uh, nodes in the strongly connected components, then this G prime is a directed acyclic graph. Um, I think I have an um, uh, uh, illustration. Here's the illustration, right? This is the graph. Strongly connected components are one, two, three, and the fourth one. So here they are, one, two, three, and the fourth one. And then there is an edge between the strongly connected component E and the, the middle blob of four nodes, because E links to the middle four nodes. There is another one from this blob to F, because again, member of this strongly connected component points to F. Here is the graph. And notice that this graph is uh, acyclic, right? So that is, that is the claim. The claim is I can take any directed graph. If I identify strongly connected components, represent them as nodes, connect strongly connected components if there are edges between the corresponding nodes in the strongly connected components, then this graph will be a DAG. That's the, that's the bottom line. OK? So now that we have this piece of graph theory in our mind, let's start looking at real data. So as I said, this comes from October 1999 from this Alta Vista search engine. Um, and as I said, the way the, the, the way the graph was constructed is that you start with a set of uh, starting points, starting web pages, and then you do a breadth first search until you cannot visit any new web page. And that means you now did a complete public crawl of the accessible web. Um, and at that point in time, 20 years ago, this was 200 million URLs, 200 million pages, and 1.5 billion links. So this was a massive graph for 20 years ago, right? Like some of you were not even born yet, right? And people were working with 100 million node graphs, right? Um, these are the authors. They just won a big award uh, two years ago uh, for a test of time award, and you know they have nice bow ties. Um, but what they were doing was basically saying, let me take this huge graph, let, and let's say that this is now the snapshot of the web, and let me try to understand its structure in terms of how these strongly connected components fit together into a direct acyclic graph. OK? So there are two issues. First is the computational issue. How do I find strongly connected components? That seems very hard. And uh, the observation is that doing this can actually be quite uh, easy, right? So you can take, again, remember we define this notion out, out component of a given node V, which is a set of nodes that, you know, that can be reached from V. I show this uh, up here, right? Sorry. Right? So that's up there. And then what is a strongly connected component that node V uh, belongs to? It's simply the, the intersection of the nodes V can reach and the nodes that uh, can, can reach V, right? If I can both, if V can reach me and I can reach V, then I'm in the strongly connected component of V, right? So what's the idea? The idea is if I can do breadth for search, which is 
doing the out component. And I create another graph, let's call it G prime, which is the same as G, just edge directions are flipped. Then I need to do two breadth first searches from the node V, take the intersection, and that's my strongly connected component that V belongs to. Okay? So the idea is um, imagine uh, I do the, um, the breadth first search from here on the reverse graph, I get the in component, um, and then I also, sorry, um, and then I also do the out component. So maybe I show you this on this example. Here's my graph, here's the node of interest. I will first do the outward breadth first search and I identify the out component. So these are all the nodes that we can reach, right? If I start here, traverse the edge directions, these are all the nodes I can reach. So that's the out component of node A. Now what I can do is I can flip directions of all these edges and I can repeat the breadth first search. Now, because all the edges are flipped, I will identify the in component, right? Imagine. I start from here, but I can only traverse the edge if I traverse it in the wrong direction. So I can go to this guy, I can go to that guy, I can then go here, I can go to B, um, but I cannot go to G because that's the wrong thing, right? So here is now the out component and the in component. Yes? How can we be sure that C will be observed? Because we can only flip that edge if we know if C was observed in the first place. Great. How, you say, how would I even crawl? How would my web spider identify this node? Uh, great point. The only way I would identify it is that I would start, I would have to have a list. Otherwise, there's no way I could, like a web crawler, like a Google's web crawler, could ever discover this guy. Unless somebody registers it and says, hey, I exist. Because nobody points to it. That's a great point. All right, so why, uh, what, are you what you are asking is, an, um, is a very good question. Because now this really means, do we really have a complete graph of the web? And what are we missing? Because we'll be missing a lot of these types of things. Good point, right? So now what is a strongly connected component that V is member of? It's just the intersection of these two sets. So here's a strongly connected component that node, uh, in our case, node A is part of. So this is uh, A, uh, uh, B, E, and D, right? So you have these four nodes that are strongly connected component that node V belongs to, okay? And it turns out that this is all we need and uh, to be able to do this computation. Um, and the reason why this is impressive is because these guys had a machine with 16 gigabytes of memory. That's how much your laptop has today. And that was kind of a super huge beefy server they had. Like nobody had such a big machine as they had, but it was your laptop, right? And they were able to analyze this 200 million node graph and do this uh, BFS uh, by fitting the graph in memory and running this 20 years ago on this, on this uh, less than what you have in your laptop today, okay? So uh, here is what they find, right? They would pick a couple of nodes, um, and they would run the, uh, the out BFS, and they would run the in BFS. And the first thing they observe is that if you say, I will take some number of starting nodes, and for every starting node, I will ask, how many other nodes do I visit? Okay? And what you notice is either if you start at, I know, this, this on these nodes, you get stuck very quickly. You visit maybe about 100 nodes, 200, and then, and then you cannot visit anyone else. But if you would start at any of the nodes here, you essentially visit many, many nodes in the graph. Okay? Is it clear what this is trying to say? Let's say I, I pick 100 different starting nodes. For every starting node, I see how many nodes does BFS visit. And I just sort the starting nodes by the number of nodes the BFS visited, right? So you see that for about 20%, I cannot visit anyone. For 20 to, let's say, 50, I visit up to 100. And for the other half of the starting nodes, I visit a huge number, right? This is logarithmic axis, right? So this is 10x, another 10x, another 10x, OK? So um, that's the first observation. I either get stuck immediately, quickly, or I visit um, hundreds of millions of nodes, OK? Uh, that's the first cool, interesting thing. And notice that huge gap phase transition here, right? This is empty, right? You either get stuck here, or you get all the way up there. Like it's a big step, a big jump, OK? So what did they find out? When they did this, they basically find that this number is 100 million, right? So what this means is that for about half of the nodes, 
uh, the size of the out component is about 100 million. And the same, this is now for the, uh, for the, in, uh, the in component. They find out that the in component is also about 100 million uh, for about uh, half of the nodes for these guys here where the BFS explodes. Um, and then they also say, see if when they take the, the intersection of this 100 million and this 100 million, they are left with about 56 million nodes. This is a, the strongly connected component. And basically, based on just this analysis, they come up with a conceptual picture of the web, right? So what do we know? We know that the out component is about 100 million. We know that the in component is about 100 million. And we know that the two, that the two components have 56 million in the, in the overlap, right? So this means that you can compose this and say, aha, I have two sets. They are initially 100 million. They have 50 in the overlap. So it means that this together is about 150 million different nodes. And there is another 50 million scattered somewhere. And they conceptualize this in this notion of the bow tie structure of the web, where this is exactly what I showed you. Right? This is the 56 million nodes in the strongly connected component. Then here and here are the nodes that this plus this is 100 million, this plus that is 100 million. And then now you are at 144 millions, 150 millions. So you need another 50 million nodes that they call them tendrils that kind of hang off or tubes, disconnected components, and so on. Right? So they come up with this conceptual picture of the web graph, which says, here is the core of the web graph where anyone can reach anyone else. This is a strongly connected component. There is a part of the web graph where you can only kind of get into it, but you cannot get back. There is another part where you can start from getting here, but again, you cannot get back. And then there are some examples of this kind of tendrils, these tentacles that link in and out component and so on, right? But it's about one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, and another quarter, right? Um, and um, that's, that's what these guys learned by basically running a couple of BFS searches over a giant graph. So, um, it's quite cool. Um, any questions? Okay, so now we kind of know that web is a bow tie. Okay, so now the question is, could I identify how important are different nodes that are part of this big, uh, big graph? And we'll talk about this method called page rank. And this was really the, the algorithm that made Google search work. So this was one of the foundational patterns that led to Google uh, search engine. And you can see the Google server just outside the classroom. I don't know if you noticed it. But there is a uh, Lego uh, server made out of Legos. That's the original Google server uh, that was running in the CS department on the fourth floor in InfoLab um, in like 96, 97. OK? So um, and the algorithm they developed um, is called PageRank. So here is how this works, right? So their, their idea was to say not all pages on the web are equal. And when you run a query, we don't only care to find pages that contain the query words, but we want to identify the most, the most important pages that have the query words. So the question is, how do you rank the pages? And that's why this is called page rank, because it gives you a ranking of the pages or ranking of the nodes, right? So the idea is, if you have this web graph, you know, is this node more important or that node more important? And how would you decide on importances of the nodes in the graph? So the one, the goal is we want to rank the pages um, of the graph of the web graph based on the link structure of the web graph. Um, and this area that tries to do these kinds of ranking and analyze the structure of the graph, it's called link analysis. And the goal is to identify importance of different nodes in the graph. And we'll talk about this family of methods called page rank. Then we'll talk about personalized page rank. And then we'll also talk about random walk with restarts. And we will see that these are just kind of variations of the method. OK? Here is how we think of this. We think of this as saying links are like votes, right? We will say page is important if it has a lot of links. Then we need to decide, is it incoming or outgoing links, right? So you know, stanford.edu can have a lot of in links. You know, some unknown guy gets one in link, for example, if they are lucky, right? So 
then you could say, OK, I will just do it based on the number of links that the page gets. But then you could say, but not all in links are equal, right? In links from important pages count more, right? Um, and this is now interesting because you say your importance depends on the links you get. And then the importance of someone you link to depends on your own importance. And this is a recursive question, right? Recursive in a sense that my importance depends on who links to me. And someone else's importance depends who links to them. And kind of, it's the same thing, right? So we need to resolve this. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. But the idea right now will be that we say links are votes. And links from more important pages make you more important. So it's not only kind of about the number of friends you have, but also how important your friends are. That's one way to say it, right? So the idea is that this link, a vote from a more important page, is worth more. And the idea is the following, that each page will have a number of links, and each page will have an importance. And when page creates outlinks, it will essentially take its importance, and it will evenly split it along all the outlinks. Um, so this means if a page i with importance r sub i has uh, d sub i outlinks, then each of the targets gets r sub i divided by d sub i credit or vote from that page uh, i, right? And uh, page j's own importance is simply the sum of the votes on its inlinks, right? So to show you here, right, if I say uh, this node j, let's see, yes, great, right, this node j here, right, it will take one third of the importance from node i. Why one third? Because i has three outlinks. It will get one quarter of the importance of k because k has four links and uh, four outlinks, and it will sum them that up, and that's j's own importance. And then it will take the, its own importance and split it three ways to each of the three blue outgoing uh, neighbors, right? So the importance of j is a, is a third of importance of i plus a quarter of importance of k. And uh, sorry. Um, and then similarly, now these guys will each get one third of the j's importance. Okay, and this is how um, this will work. So um, basically what we say is we say page is important if it's pointed to by other important pages. So the way we can now define the rank of a given page j is simply my importance, if I'm j, is a sum over all the nodes i that point to me. I take their importance divided by their out degree and sum it together, right? I see who's a friend of myself. I ask them how important they are, how big out the degree they have. I divide, sum it up. That's my own importance, okay? Where d sub i is the out degree of node i. Um, and uh, to give you an example, I'll be using this running example from uh, when the web was very young with the three uh, websites. Um, <laughs> and you can guess what they mean, right? Um, and uh, the idea here is, right, that each of these guys has an importance, right? Y, A, and M, right? Um, and the importance of Y, for example, it, it's because Y has a self loop. It will be, uh, and it has two outgoing links. Importance of Y is half of its own importance plus half of the importance of node A because node A has two outlinks, right? And for example, node A, its importance is half of the importance of y coming this way, and then also all the importance of m because m has only one outlink. And then what is the importance of m? Importance of m is half of the importance of a because a takes its importance and splits it among two outgoing connections. OK? So that's basically it. And now what do you notice? You notice I have three equations and three unknowns. So I could basically go and solve this system of equations. I could say I need the fourth equation. The fourth equation could be importance as sum to 1. And I could do Gaussian elimination and solve this. Um, even though this sounds like a good idea, um, it's kind of not a good idea because this will never scale to billions of pages. So we cannot just say, here's the system of equations. Let's solve it. You had a question? Uh, is y self-link fair? 
Excuse me? Is why is self link fair? Because it would seem that it could, it could uh, accept many in, in links, but then hog all of its outlinks by making each of its outlinks unimportant by having many self links. Um, how to say, uh, nothing in life is fair. Uh, <laughs> No, uh, great, but uh, great point, right? Like you are asking a great question. So the way PageRank is defined is the following way. Now, if you are Google, you can say, hey, will people game me? And if you take my winter class 246, we'll talk about how do you game this? And there is an entire industry that is gaming this graph, right? Because being on top of the Google search results can be quite valuable. So there is huge operations on how do you manipulate the graph? How do you create these self-links? How do you create entire, they are called spam farms, entire farms of web pages that kind of funnel their importance to whoever is willing to pay? So it's a great question you are asking. Um, we won't answer, like take my winter class if you want to understand that. But it's a, good, it's a good point. It's a perfectly valid point. And of course, you need to ask yourself if you say, I'm Google. Do I want to now pre pre prune, pre-process, clean this graph of this type of spammers who could create one million links there and the page, page rank will just get trapped? So this is an awesome question. And I'll, I'll return to it even more in, in a bit. All right, thank you. Good, this is exciting, thank you. So uh, great, how can we think of this? The way we can think of this is that what do we need? We need to take the graph and we'll represent the graph as this matrix M. And we will call this M to be a column stochastic. Why do we say column stochastic? Because if I'm node J and I have um, three outlinks, then I will, have I will put one third on every outlink. So this means that every column will have to sum to one. Right? If every entry is one over the degree, and I'm one over out degree, so um, uh, the sum will be equal to one. OK? So if node uh, j links to i, then m i j is 1 over the degree of j, OK? And now uh, this page, and we will define this notion of a page rank vector r, where I have one entry, one dimension per page. Um, and uh, this entry i of the page rank vector uh, r is the importance of page i. And as I hinted before, we will require that the importance is sum to 1, so that we have a probability distribution over the web pages. You can think of it that way. But just we, we require importances to sum to one. Then you can take this definition of page rank that I gave you before. You can basically take this equation we saw before, and you can rewrite it in terms of this matrix equation. right? You can say the importances of the nodes, if I have the importances of the nodes, if they push this importance one step, step, step up to its neighbors, I get back the importances. right? Um, and now you guys should be like, huh, I've seen this before, right? We've seen this before when we talked about matrices and eigenvectors and eigenvalues, right? We had this type of recursive equations where the same thing appeared on both hands. And remember, at that time, I had some lambda thingy here, right? I don't have it anymore because this means that now solution, my page rank vector, will be the, will be the eigenvector that corresponds to the eigenvalue of one of this matrix, right? This is a bit of a preview of what's happening. That's why I was saying that this is the most beautiful kind of linear algebra algorithm, right? So uh, this is a recursive equation because I have R um, on both ends. So let me give you an example. Here's again the same graph that I had before. Here are my uh, flow equations. And the way I could write this out is the following. Here is my matrix uh, M. Notice that every column sums to 1, and that the entry is um, uh, ij uh, is 1 over the out degree of j, right? This is, uh, this is, the, this is the matrix uh, M. And what, what do I say? Uh, if I now say r equals m times r, here is my r, here is m and r. And you should notice how um, basically these equations are preserved, right? m equals r 1 half. So if I take m and multiply these two things, this is the only term that survives, for example. right? So this is equivalent to that. Here's kind of pictorial example. Um, and I challenge you to find a mistake if you think there is one. But this is that. Okay. So pictorially, we have the same thing. 
Now, let me give you a bit of a um, explanation or intuition of this, what we call flow-based formulation. And here is the idea. So page rank equations are very related to this notion of random walks and random surfers uh, on the web, right? So imagine I have a web graph and I have this uh, surfer, right? Surfer serves the web graph, like a surfer serves the wave, right? But this surfer um, is a random surfer. So he serves the graph at random, right? So this means that at any time t, let's say that the surfer is at some page i. And then to the, what will the, the surfer do? At time um, t plus 1, the surfer will follow one of the outlinks from this page i selected uniformly at random. OK, so this is a random surfer. Surfer comes to the, to the node, looks at the outgoing links, picks one at random, and makes a step. And then again, to a new node, picks one of the outgoing links at random, and takes a step. And that's what the surfer does, right? Um, and this surfer is a random surfer, never gets tired, surfs infinitely long this web graph. Basically, randomly walks across this web graph. So let's say the following. Let's P sub t, uh, p of t be a vector whose ith coordinate is a probability that the surfer is at a given page i at some time t, right? So p of t is a probability distribution over pages, right? So now let's ask ourselves, what is p of t plus 1, right? And p of t plus 1, the way I can think of this is if at time t the surfer is one of the pages, at the next step, uh, at the next time, surfer will take one step. So it means that, for example, the probability that the surfer will be at page i is the probabilities that the surfer was at the, at the pages, uh, sorry, the probability that at time t plus 1, surfer is at page j will depend on the probability um, that, the per that the surfer was at time t at the pages i and their out degree, right? Um, so this means that it, if, if at time t the surfer was at any of the pages i, um, the surfer would pick a link at random and make a step. And the question is, how likely is, is the surfer to end up at j? Which is basically just the, uh, it, it's equal to the probability of the node be, uh, of the surfer being at any of the pages i, and then what is also the out degree of page i, right? So this equation is that probability at t plus 1 equals my matrix m times the probability vector of where the surfer is at time t. OK? So that's the, the important equation, right? Basically, we follow a link uniformly at random, right? So now let's suppose that after some time, this random walk reaches some steady state, which means that the probability distribution at time t is um, equal to uh, um, um, probability distribution at time t plus 1 equals uh, the probability distribution at time t, right? So this is my kind of my equation. I'm saying my probability distribution converged. And this would mean that p of t is what is called stationary distribution of a random walk, right? I converged to some distribution that kind of gets preserved as a random walker makes more steps. OK? But what's the point? The point is that we said the original vector r satisfies this equation. And now here, I essentially wrote the same equation again. Just I called p of t, and here, it, here I called it r. So what this means is that r is a stationary distribution of this random walk. OK? So what, what, did we say, what we are saying is that if I solve this r equals m times r, then essentially what I'm doing, what the, what the semantics meaning of this vector r is to say, Let's take this random surfer. Let's let the random surfer walk around infinitely long so that, and, and then I just ask, what is the probability distribution of where the surfer might be at some time t? And that is what the page, page rank is measuring. Um, please ask me a question now. Yes? This is bodily convergence, basically. This is what we are, so, yes. This is modeling. It's not modeling. Basically, yeah. Maybe another way to say is this is modeling the stationary distribution of this random walker process on the graph. Right? So why is this interesting is because we started with these ideas of links as wolves. 
And then I started somewhere very different. I said, let's have this random guy walking the graph. And the point is that if this random, walk, random walker walks the graph long enough, it will converge to some stationary distribution where the time doesn't really matter anymore, right? The, the present and the future are the same. So this will converge where it won't be really matter what's the time. The random walker will just kind of spread across the graph, and it won't matter where it started. I'll just kind of know where it might be. Yes? So it seems like there are some ways that you could initialize P of T such that it wouldn't converge. Like you, know, you put all the mass on one component so that the walker can't escape, right? Great question. Uh, hold your question. Uh, I will get to it in two slides. But great question. Yeah, you're right. Uh, so the question was that this graph has to have a certain property because this may not converge. That's what you were asking, right? And I'll tell you what the graph needs to be for this to converge. Good point. All right, anything else? I want to take some questions because this is very important because it builds kind of this fundamental intuition for uh, this linear algebra we did. So now it's a great time to ask me questions, meditate this slide, things like that. Yes, go ahead. What if like the person's like or like the surfer's preferences change over time? Does this algorithm catch that? Great. So here the the model of the surfer is that the surfer picks a link uniformly at random. Right? Takes the outgoing link uniformly at random. The surfer, you could have a model where the surfer picks these links preferentially based on some pre-assigned probabilities. You can have that, and that's an extension of this model. But the, the beauty here is that this is extremely simple, has this random walker analogy, and uh, at the end boils down to basically finding an eigenvector of a, of a matrix. Right? So you have this kind of links as waltz intuition, you have this random surfer intuition, and at the end both are the same. OK, great. So what did we learn so far? We said that the flow equations can be rewritten as this uh, m equals uh, r equals m times r. We talked that the rank vector, uh, this means that the rank vector is the eigenvector of the, this stochastic web matrix m. Given the, given the random walk explanation, what this means is that we can start with any vector u. We can start with any distribution where the random walker starts the walk. But if we iterate this thing long enough, right? We take u multiplied by m, we get a new u multiplied by m again, multiplied by m. If we keep multiplying this long enough, we will converge to, to a given stationary vector, right? So if I take this, that r equals m times r, and kind of I unroll that, that for loop there, then this is what I get, OK? So this means that this vector r is a, its limiting distribution is the principal eigenvector of matrix M, which is this page rank, right? So this means that R is the limit of taking some, re some vector U and then just multiplying it with M long enough, um, and I will end up with some stationary vector R, right? Which means that basically this will be the case, right? So if I would somehow, let's say, initialize R here, then this is an R. That is an R, that is an R, that is an R, it's an R, right? Um, but because we said that even if I start with something different than R, if I still keep multiplying, I will end up with the R, OK? So now this means that we can efficiently solve for R. And this method is called power iteration. So let me tell you what power iteration is, right? So basically, given, uh, given uh, a graph with n nodes, um, then all we will do is the following. We will initialize our r0 to be some vector, let's say 1 over n, just uniform. And then we will iterate this uh, r at t plus 1 equals m times r at t. And we'll keep iterating this until we converge. What does, what does it mean we converge? Between the, the difference between vector at time t plus 1 and vector t is less than epsilon. And in practice, this iteration will converge in about 50, 100, or about 100 iterations, and will be done, right? So what does this mean? This means that before I said we have these flow equations. Now what I'm saying is you just start with some arbitrary vector r, 
keep multiplying it with m, keep doing this long enough, and you will converge to the solution. Right? So rather than solving a system of equations, we are just iterating this for loop until we converge. And we will have the solution. And we will converge to the principal eigenvector of the matrix M. Right? So now this is like even, even more cool, right? Because now, basically, we are solving a system of equations by just multiplying some uh, vector with a matrix enough times. And that's even cooler. Yes? Have we somehow made the assumption that this is irreducible? Um, we have made a few assumptions that I will clarify. We made the assumption that M is column stochastic. And that's in some sense, so yeah. But I'll, I'll, come, I'll come to talk more about what are the uh, assumptions about M. But we made an assumption that it's irreducible, yes. Good. Anything else? Yes? How dependent is this on the initialization? Uh, this should work for any initialization. If M has the right properties, this will always work. You don't need to worry. So people would usually just initialize to be like uniform, as I showed. OK, let me now uh, tell you a bit more how to solve. Right? So we talked about this. We said we can run this, this uh, R equals M times R, or we run this iteration until we converge. So let me show you whether, uh, whether this will converge. Right? Here's my iteration. Here's the graph. Here is matrix M. Here are the equations. Here is how I initialize. And all I will do now, I will take this R. Here it is. Multiply it with M. And I will get a new vector. And I will now take this vector, multiply it with uh, M again. And I'll get a new vector. And I'll take this guy, multiply it with M again. And I'll get a new vector. And if I keep doing, this is what I will converge to. Right? Um, and uh, these are now my importances. So page Y has importance 6 over 15. Another page A has importance 6 over 15. And page M has importance 3 over uh, 15. OK? This would be how this would work. So now the question is, right? I showed you an example where everything works perfectly. So now the question is, for general matrices M or for general graphs, does this converge? Does it converge to where we want? And are the results reasonable? So let me now tell you about some corner cases, how this basic idea needs to be fixed. OK? There are two problems why this won't converge. And that goes to your question. right? So the first thing why this won't converge is these dead ends. right? These are the pages in the out component that you get into, but there's no one, nowhere to go out from. right? And uh, right, what does this mean? If you think of yourself as a random walker, you just came to the end of the clip, cliff. You came to a web page that has no outgoing edges. You don't know what to do. So this means that these dead ends, these web pages without outlinks, they what, it, what is called they leak out importance. Basically, the random surfer goes and doesn't know what to do because there's nowhere to go. So that's one problem, pages without any outlinks. There is another problem, which is called spider traps. And these are um, basically cycles where the random walker gets trapped. right? Um, and this means that eventually the spider trap will absorb all importance. So let me give you an example. Here is a spider trap problem. Imagine I have this graph where there is a self loop in B. And imagine of this random surfer idea. right? A random surfer starts somewhere, but as soon as the random surfer navigates to node B, it gets trapped in the node B all the time. And if I start, for example, if I create a matrix M out of this, and I would do the power iteration, essentially very quickly the thing would converge where B has all the importance and A has no importance. And this is kind of the results we don't want, right? Like this node A still has some importance, even though the random surfer gets trapped in B and never can get out of it. So this, this is the example of the spider trap. And then this is the example of a dead end. If I now take and create the matrix uh, as I show. And I would uh, start with some starting vector and, mu and multiply. You see the random walker starts at A, goes to B, and then there's nowhere to go from B, so all the importance is lost. And this is the importance leaked out of the system. right? So um, these are the issues where our, 
our motivate our method will now fail um, if there are these types of structures in the graph. So basically, points nodes that are dead ends or these types of cycles straps where the the random walker can get into but then cannot get out of. Okay, and the question is how would we solve this? And the way we can solve this is to define this notion of random uh, a random teleportation or a random jump. So our random walker will change a bit. So the process for the random walker will change the following. Whenever a random walker makes a step, the, the walker, the surfer, has two options. The walker will come, flip a coin, and uh, with probability beta, the, the walker will keep following the links. And with probability 1 minus beta, the, the walker will jump, will teleport to some other web page. right? And usually, this value of beta is 0.85, right? So uh, basically means about one in five cases the random walker will jump, and for the rest of the times the random walker will follow the links, right? So the way you can think of it, if this was our graph before, now at any node you can kind of decide to jump. You can just come to the node and say, oh, I won't follow, I'll just teleport, right? Kind of Scotty beam me up type thing, right? So um, this is what will happen, okay? So how does this, uh, um, why does this help with spider traps? This is a solution for spider traps because M here is a spider trap. The random walker will be trapped a bit here, but sooner or later the random walker will decide to jump out and will basically be able to drop this cycle here. So that's why teleports solve the spider trap problem. You are no longer trapped in the trap because you can always teleport. So sooner or later, the, the random walker will jump out. And then what is the solution to the dead ends? The solution to the dead ends are also teleports, where basically we say, if you come to a dead end, always teleport. Right? So the idea is that rather than thinking of this graph like that, we think of it that if I come to M and there's nowhere else to go, I'll just teleport with probability 1. OK? Um, and why is this important? Because before, we were saying that M has to be column stochastic, right? We said it's an adjacency matrix where columns sum to 1. But notice that M has no out degree. So this column does not sum to 1. And that was the violation why power iteration did not work in the, in the dead end problem. So we will now here add 1 third, 1 third, 1 third. So if you come to M, you just jump. Where do you jump? to any of the three nodes, each one with equal probability. right? So that's what we did um, in this case. OK? So what is, the, what is the solution to the dead ends and spider traps? Why do teleports solve the problem? As I said, for spider traps, spider traps by itself are kind of not a problem from the convergence point of view. But they are a problem because PageRank gives us something we don't want. right? It gives us kind of a trivial result that's useless. So solution is, we don't want to be stuck in a spider trap. So we will use a teleportation so that after some finite number of steps in the spider trap, we teleport out of it and we solve, uh, we, we save ourselves. Right? That's the spider trap. And then dead ends kind of are a problem. Our method does not converge to the right thing. And the point is that dead ends, if we don't take care of dead ends, the matrix is not column stochastic, so our initial assumptions are not met. So the solution is to make the matrix column stochastics by always teleporting where there is kind of nowhere else to go. Right? If I come to a node that has no outlinks, I just teleport myself. All right? These are the two important details. So, And this is exactly what Google's PageRank algorithm is. It's basically a random walker with teleports where the teleports um, happen with probability 1 if you end up in a dead end. So the, the process for the random walker is you make a step. With some probability, you follow links at random. With the remaining probability, you jump. And the way you can write this out is the following. You say importance of node j is, these are now importances of node i. But this only happens with probability beta. So with probability beta, I decide to the random walker was at any of these guys and decided to make a step. This is the probability that the, that the walker was there. This is 1 over that is probability that my link was chosen. And then 
they, they make this step with probability beta. And then what is this last part? It says, uh huh, but with probability one minus beta, the random walker decided to teleport, to jump. What's the probability that they jumped on me, node j? It's one over the number of nodes, because we are assuming that the teleportation happens uniformly at random. OK? So this is now our new page rank equation, right? We had this part before. Now we multiply it with this probability to actually take a random link. And then this is the probability of not taking a link. And this is basically saying the probability that the random walker will just directly teleport to our node j at, uh, by itself, right? So um, this means if a node has no inlinks, its importance will be non-zero. This is the importance of a node with no inlinks. There's no other way to get to the node than to directly jump to it, right? Where n is the total number of nodes in the graph, OK? Um, great. Any uh, note that here in this, I'm assuming there are no dead ends. I'll fix the dead ends a bit later. OK? Yes? about after 50 or 100 iterations it will convert I'm wondering uh, so when the end become larger and larger from billion to billion is that still true aha uh -huh. you are asking how long as this becomes bigger as the graph gets bigger how of how long does it does it take um, it it will take a few tens of iterations um, ha huh. let me say the following Usually, people would, in practice, you only run this for, a, for some number of tens of iterations. Because what you really care about is not for every single node for the page rank score to converge. But you really care about getting the scores of the important guys. right? So still, in practice, people would run this a couple of tens of iterations. Like that MapReduce framework, if you guys know, was developed to run this in some sense. Right, or one was, the, was one of the workloads that led to development of MapReduce. All right, let me now, uh, so this is the equation I had from the previous slide. If we now want to write this in the, in, the, in the linear algebra, we have to define this new matrix A that is called the, the, the Google matrix. And the Google matrix will be beta times M. This is the M we had before, plus this uh, matrix of uh, uh, random walk destinations, 1 minus beta divided by um, 1 over m, right? And if I write um, A in the following way, then now I can rewrite my A R equals m times R as R equals A times R, where A is now this matrix, right? So what does this mean? This means that even this random walk with teleportations is still an eigenvector of a different matrix, right? This matrix A that is both the matrix M plus some constant matrix, right? Um, and uh, this is what I wanted to say here. And as I said, beta is usually between 0.8 and 0 0.9. 0 0.85 is a good number. So let me just show you what I mean, what we just did. We said, here is our graph. Here is our matrix M. Notice that uh, node M is now a spider trap. So this is matrix M. Then here is the random teleport uh, matrix uh, that I have. So my matrix A will be 0.8 times M plus 0.2 times this one third type matrix, right? And if I add the two together, this is my matrix A, right? So what this means is that if I come to a given node, here is how I'm going to leave. Um, uh, this is how I'm going to leave that node, right? With probability 5 over 7, I will navigate to y. Um, with probability 5 over 7, I'll navigate to a, and 1 over 15 by to m. Uh, why is it? Um, uh, uh, why are things this way? Because, for example, to to, to go to this node, uh, the probability of traversing by by uh, link is zero, but I get the random jump part, right? So that's why this will be um, this way. So this means now, if I take my starting vector and I multiply it with this uh, matrix A, here are the transition probabilities. Um, and if I multiply this, this will converge to the following result, where Y will have the most uh, importance, 
this is now I think M and this is A if I yeah right um, do people have any questions about this yes the links created by random teleports exactly right so what I did is I added these links to denote random teleports and I randomly teleport with 1 over 15 which is um, I can jump to any of the three nodes and to and I will uh, teleport 20% of the time so it's a one f one fifth times one one third so it's 115 right while here what why is here 7 over 15 this is um, one half uh, plus uh, one fifteenth or whatever right Yes. So it seems like M has still kind of gamed the system a little bit. It's wound up with the, the most important score by giving itself a self loop. Is that kind of observed? But even though random teleportation stops you from getting completely uh, messed up by people doing spider traps, it's still kind yeah. of has an impact. Good point. So uh, M uh, gamed the system a bit because it almost like acted as a spider trap. That's a good point. Uh, so at the level of individual web pages, you could go and remove these self, self loops, right? So there is a lot of pre-processing that you could do to, like removing self, loop, self loops is easy. What is harder is detecting this kind of farm of pages that kind of coherently links to each other with the goal to improve this guy. That's harder to do, but as I said, there are methods to do that as well. All right, so let me now show you how we actually compute this. One thing you should observe is that this is now a dense matrix. So if this is uh, 200 million or a billion pages, then this is a billion times billion, right? So that's a lot of billions. Um, so uh, what do we do? Okay. So how do we actually go and compute uh, the page rank, right? Um, here's the here's the issue, right? What we want to do? The key is this iteration where I say the our previous R times A is our new R, and I want to be I want to be able to iterate this as many times as possible. If A and R and uh, R old and R new are small and I can fit them in main memory, then life is good. As I said, if I have, but if I have, for example, a billion nodes, um, and let's say I need uh, uh, four bytes uh, to save an entry, so I have, I don't know, a, a, a short float of four bytes, right? Then, um, uh, you know, and I need the two, the two vectors R new and R old, each one with a billion entries. So just to store R old and R new, I need eight gigabytes of memory. And now to store uh, the matrix A, I would need 10 to the 18 uh, um, uh, billion uh, or 10 to the 18 bytes of main memory. Uh, that's a lot. That's a billion of billion. I don't even know what kind of a gazillion this is, right? But I would need to do that. So I cannot do this, right? So the point is, I cannot even store, materialize this matrix A. I can have this matrix because it's sparse, right? This will have, in our Alta Vista case, this was 200 times 200, and then it had 1.5 billion non-zeros. Um, if I would do this, you know, a billion is 10 to the 9. Here it would be 200 million, 200 million. So um, that's uh, 10 to the 8. So this would be 10 to the 16. Um, 10 to the 10 to the 16 is uh, 10 million billions, right? It's 10 to the 7 times 10 to the 9, right? So it's a lot. I cannot do that, right? So it would be 10 million gigabytes. Yeah, that's about how much memory I would need. 10 million gigabytes. That's a lot. Okay, so maybe that's more more memory than it exists on the whole planet. Okay. So what can you do? Um, what can you do is the following. You can rearrange your uh, computation to look like this. Okay? Um, here I skipped a slide, and this will be your homework problem to basically show how you can rearrange this uh, r equals a times r to something, opa, um, to something that has this type of form. Right? So notice that now I say r equals beta times m times r plus some vector and this is now elegant because m is a sparse matrix multiplying it with a scalar is still sparse so sparse matrix times a vector that's okay and then i add some constant 
right? So all of a sudden we saved a lot, right? M is a sparse matrix. Rather than saying I need order n squared amount of memory, if I have 10 links per node on average, I need 10 times n amount of memory to, to work or space to work with them. Okay? So this means that because I can rewrite my, my iteration this way, I can basically distribute R next to the M, and I have this constant term here, I can now iterate this much more efficiently, and, and I never have to, uh, have to materialize my matrix set. So what does this mean? This means that in each iteration, all I have to do is compute, take the R old, multiply it with M, multiply it with beta to get the R new. And then all I have to do, I have to add this constant value 1 minus beta over N to each entry in R new. And that's essentially all I have to do. Um, there is a note. If M contains dead ends, then some page rank will leak. So the sum over uh, j of r nu will be less than 1. And all I have to do is I have to kind of multiply the vector so that we have to, I have to renormalize it so that the components sum to 1. And this is essentially inserting the leaked page rank due to, um, uh, due to dead ends. Right? So essentially, what does this mean is I can just take my matrix M, um, run it, even don't worry if it's not column stochastic. With every iteration, a bit of page rank will leak out. I just need to renormalize this so that it sums to 1. And that's essentially inserting the leaked page rank. And this is the algorithm. Yes. You're not jumping out of happiness. Yes. How do we, how do we quantify the, the leak now? Leak, uh, leaked amount depends on how many dead ends are there. If there are no dead ends, nothing will leak. So you just reinsert it. It's kind of part of the algorithm. It's not, this is a, it's mathematically the right thing to do. So this is not a hack or a problem. It's a convenience, right? Because it means you don't even have to pre-process M. You don't have to worry about anything. You just insert what, what you leaked, and you get the right thing. Yes, Chris. Are you missing an R at the end of the equation? Should it be that constant 1 minus beta over N and then times R again? Uh, no, no, no. I, I don't need to multiply it. I just add it in. Right? I add it to R. Right? Basically, I just run this. And then to every entry of R new, I add a little constant term. And this constant term is essentially the probability that the random walker will land at that node. Right, so this is the, pro like the R new will now say, given that the random walker was at R old, how likely is it to visit R new? And then there is another way to revisit R new is to directly jump to it. This is the probability of that happening. Right, and that's it. Okay, so okay. this is the, this is the, th this is it. Um, and here is the entire algorithm. It's really, uh, three lines, right? Where basically this is the iteration. I iterate until uh, there is convergence. Um, I uh, compute the R new by taking R old divided by the degree of node i times beta. And I go from uh, all the nodes i that point to the node j. Um, if the, um, and by definition, uh, the page rank of node j is 0 if the in degree of node j is 0, so if there is no way to, to get into the node. Now, um, what I have to do is I have to reinsert the leaked page rank. The way I do that is to say, how much does this, what does this r new uh, dash sum up to? And whatever it does not sum up to, I add to every term, right? So s is the sum of the r dash new. Um, and then this is how much, how much is missing to get to 1. And each node gets one, of one, one unit of that, right? Uh, this is inserting the leak page rank to get the new thing. And now, you know, the, the, the R, R old becomes R new, and I can go back here to redo it. Yes? Is there a reason why we don't multiply the vector R new 
with a certain constant so that it adds up to one again, so that we basically give, because here we get give constant one minus s over n to all the nodes. Yes. Do proportionally, right? No, no, why do you do this? Because again, you say, um, whenever I came to the dead end, I had to teleport. Where do I land? I land with equal probability everywhere. That's how you think of this, right? This is again saying, oh, and now out of the dead end, somebody, uh, the random walker landed at your place, right? So um, that's essentially it. So what this is now trying to do, essentially, it's trying, this contains two things. It contains the landing at your place because of the one minus beta, plus because I, uh, I got lost in the dead end. So notice that I'm not kind of explicitly accounting for random jumps here, all right? Let me give you an example how this would look like. Here is the graph, uh, numbers sum to 100, uh, size of the node is proportional to the number, and these are page rank scores of the uh, nodes in the graph. Um, what do I, like, let's just look at this and see that this makes a lot of sense. For example, node B has very high importance because a lot of nodes point to it. Like these nodes here that nobody points to still have some importance because the random jump can jump to them. Um, notice, for example, um, how, um, uh, for example, node C gets only one in link, but it gets it from node B. So node C is also quite important, but less important than B because B gets all these in links. Um, in some sense, uh, this B and C have a little spider trap going on, if you like to think of it that way, right? So it uh, kind of uh, um, uh, rises page rank of them both. Right, so for example, node E has a lot of inlinks from these small nodes, so its importance is also quite big. Node D is less important than E because E points to it and also to the node B. Um, and uh, um, uh, for example, F has the same importance as D because the only, only uh, node that points to D and uh, F is node E. So these two guys have the same importance, right? So this makes a lot of sense. Right, and then A, because it's pointed by D, it actually has less importance because there's also that link and there is the uh, random jump, okay? So this is an example how this, uh, how this would give you importances of the nodes on the graph. So let me now show you one application of this and we'll talk about notion of personalized page rank and we'll talk about uh, random walk with restarts. Imagine you have a graph. Imagine you have a graph of computer science conferences and, and authors, professors who publish at those conferences. And you connect a professor with a conference if the professor publishes at that conference. And then you could want to ask questions like, what is the most related conference to this conference ICDM? Or, you know, what conferences uh, would I recommend this person, Mike Jordan, to publish at, given who they publish at and where other authors publish at, right? So these are the types of questions I would like to answer. And these types of bipartite graphs, they happen a lot in the recommender systems where you have this notion of an item and a user. So this would be user item type graphs. This could be products you are selling and these are the users who use your, um, who use your website or who have made purchases before. And then you can start asking, what is the most related product to this particular product? Or what products should I rec recommend to uh, this particular person? And random walks allow you to do this. Let me show you how, right? So the idea is I'll have this bipartite graph for, of uh, users to items. I will think of items, products on the top and users um, at the bottom, right? Um, and in recommender systems, many times I wanna ask how related are two items? How related are two users? For a given user, what items should I recommend? Given that the user has already bought certain set of items. Right? And this notion of recommendations, it's called collaborative filtering, which means that I wanna recommend items to users based on what, other user, what this user has in common with other users. Right? That's kind of the basic intuition. So the question becomes, if I wanna find items that are related, I could ask, you know, are items A and A prime more related than B and B prime? How would you, how would you compute that? Right? And let me just take out the subgraphs of A, A prime, and B, and B prime. You would say, uh-huh, A and A prime are one, uh, are basically one, have one user, are two hops away, there is one user in between, but B and B prime, there's two users in between, so 
a and b should be more related uh, sorry a a prime is more related than b b prime right so you could say let's use shortest paths here's a counter example where you say huh how about now items c c prime they have two users who let's say bought both items right so who's now uh, more related a a prime or c c prime and because they have more in common it should be c c prime that are more related than a a prime but um so you could say number of common neighbors is uh, number of common users tells me how related are two items um and here's an example where this doesn't work right imagine the following imagine uh, two red users who have who have bo both bought d and d prime but then this user also bought a bunch of other items and this other user bought a bunch of other items and now you can say are d and d prime more related than c and c prime and we'd like to say that c and c and c prime are more related than d and d prime because of all this excess uh, noise here right and the question is what kind of graph algorithm would obey these types of intuitions and it turns out that random walks on graphs so basically page rank on graphs obeys exactly this type of uh, intuition right so basically personalized page rank or what is also called topic specific page rank will rank proximity of nodes with regard to the teleport set s where teleport set is the when the te random walker decides to teleport where does the random walker land right and this can be a set of nodes or the teleport set can be an individual node and then this is called random walk with restart right whenever i teleport i teleport to the starting node so the idea would be if i want to say what conferences are related to icdm i do a random walk starting here but whenever I decide to teleport, I jump back here, right? And this way, I will identify what conferences and what authors are most visited when random walker starts at ICDM. And, that's, and that is the answer. So one way how you can implement this would be to basically take this um, <coughs> teleport set S, make it into a vector, and then um, run your power iteration. But it turns out, you don't even have to run power iteration. What it turns out is you can do this basically by just simulating the random walk, right? So the idea is that every node will have some importance and that importance of the nodes get evenly split among all the edges adjacent to that node um, and this gets pushed through. So the idea is that we will start with some query set of nodes and then we will simulate the random walk where we make a step um, at random um, and for every uh, node, we will count how often the random walk visited the node. And uh, as I said, we will also flip the coin with probability alpha. We will restart the walk t at one of the query nodes. And the uh, nodes with the highest visit count, those are your uh, recommendations, right? So the idea is the following. You have a query. You will now start the random walk here, literally simulate it and you will keep the visit count of how often you visited each node. And then you either continue walking or you decide, decide to restart. And you will just keep a counter for every node, how often was this node uh, visited. Here is the pseudocode, it's amazingly simple. Um, and for example, if you would start with this query node, this would be the visit counts, right? So you would say, what are the most uh, related nodes to this node? It would be this particular node and that node. This one has visit count 16, this one has visit count 14, right? And this means that you can now create recommendations very, very quickly. Whoever looks at this, you say, hey, why don't you look at that and that as well? And uh, this is a very simple recommender system to write that works really well um, in practice and has been deployed many, 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 many times, right? And all you are doing, you have this kind of different users let's say they are interested in different topics you have your products users interact with products and now you are starting to say which products have the most users in common where the random walk kind of nicely accounts for multiple connections multiple paths 
direct in and direct and indirect connections and also degree of the node right if we have a user who who has super high degree um, its importance will get split along many different nodes so to show you an example right I said given my graph uh, what are the closest conferences to to um, to ICDM I can also ask more complex queries I can ask what are closest conference to uh, to KDD and ICDM right so I can use multiple starting points um, to answer uh, the query and uh, this is essentially what I wanted to say and to summarize we talked about page rank where we have this teleportation and the teleportation vector is uniform right it means whenever we decide to teleport we can teleport anywhere in the graph with equal probability then you have this notion of topic specific or personalized page rank where the idea is you teleport to some subset of nodes and then random walk with restarts its teleportation vector is different you always teleport to the same starting node so the teleportation vector looks like this and the point is while this one and this one we usually solve with power iteration random walk with restarts you can just simulate like literally you can simulate the random walker and that is super fast super easy and gives really good results um so with this i'm done if anyone has questions uh please come talk to me thanks a lot
check. Okay. <laughs> I'm putting the chair at the door because I don't have, I still don't have.